uh, nature, my love of nature, the resources, the setting, Bhutan's uh, convictions were common. You know, they were they resonated with me, and all of that played a role in putting this book together in this place in a very short time. In seven, well, let me not even seventeen months, about nine to ten months. So this book happened. This book happened here, and. It, it, was not a book on education it was a book on something a little bit frivolous maybe but it's not really frivolous you'll see it as as i go on um as dinner decor so that answers one part of the question the other uh, the other reason was um um as people began to see my dinner decor on facebook i got requests from the ministry of external affairs uh, spouses association the president of the spouses association who actually requested me to write a book that would be like a guide book for younger spouses my younger colleagues in the foreign ministry so that's why this book got written we've come across uh, many diplomats who uh, express the positive influence they've had on on themselves after their stint in bhutan but it is really heartening to know that Bhutan has not only had a positive influence on you, but it actually influenced you to do this book on Dinner Decker. You can't hear me. Okay. <laughs> it's really heartening, Amita, to know that uh, uh, it has Bhutan has influenced you to write this book. Uh, if you could share with us, what is the link between food and aesthetics? Yes, this uh, this session is titled Food and Aesthetics. So I think let me just okay one disclaimer before I begin. I am not an artist. I am not a decorator. I am not a designer. I am an educator, and I've studied political science. So um, this is my view of aesthetics. Um, uh, aesthetics is it basically is the branch of philosophy that deals with the principles of beauty. So then, what is beauty? Beauty is something that uh, appeals to the senses. Do I need to make a case for food and the senses? Do I? This is going to be a bit of an interactive session, okay? So, do you think I need to make a case for this? Because we don't eat only with our taste buds. We eat we 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 actually eat with all our senses. We look at textures of food. Is it grainy? Is it watery? Is it uh, lumpy? Is it crisp? We look of course the smells may be delicious or not. Uh what about the ears? There is a recipe in Chinese cuisine called singing rice. Okay? So what they have is a little uh, cake of puffed rice on which they come a crispy uh, cake of uh, puffed rice on which they pour a sizzling hot sauce or gravy and that the sizzle of it is enticing. It builds your anticipation for the food. So we also uh, eat food with our ears. And then what about the sense of sight? We garnish our food. Don't we use garnishes to make our food look good? Food that looks good entices us. And for that we garnish our food. We use you know peels of fruits and and uh, and vegetables. We cut them into little you know springs and put them on the edge of a glass or on food or there's the Thai art of uh, carving food uh, fruits and vegetables all that is garnished to entice you so we eat with all our five senses there that's the connection between food and aesthetics what is the connection with dinner decor to me dinner decor is the immediate most immediate connection is that dinner decor is a kind of garnish so can i have my first slide with that i'm going to move on to uh, talking about a little bit about aesthetics and dinner decor uh this is this is what the book looks like so that's uh, the garnish of dinner decor is it enticing you don't have to say it is <laughs> um so yes so that's the immediate connection that it is a garnish but it is much much more and you will see that as we go along it's much more than just something for the uh sense of sight for the visual appeal uh i'm an educator i tend to stand up when i do a presentation i hope that's okay okay 
Great. So, um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so that's the garnishing that you put on food. How do we garnish a, a dinner table? What's the garnish for a dinner table? It's plates and silverware and nice napkins and, uh, and much more. You will see that what I use in my dinner decor is much, much more. I'm going to be talking about dinner decor and the aesthetics of dinner decor, not only from the point of view of my book, but also from the point of view of the concept of dinner decor. Okay, so the next slide, please. So it's a kind of garnish and that's how we create it. So let's go on to some of the principles, again, from my untrained point of view not being an artist or a decorator or an interior designer. Okay? The first thing is balance. Harmony, symmetry and cohesiveness. I'm going to do this with slides from the uh, pictures from the book. Let's go to the next one. Now when you use colors, uh, you use colors, right? I'm not someone who creates pristine, uh, white, stiff dinner decor that intimidates guests. I like color. I like an exuberance of color. So, but what happens is, if you use five or six colors or eight colors, how do you harmonize them? What do you notice in this, in this picture? There are, s do you notice anything? I don't want to spend too much time on the interaction because we'll be short of time. Do you notice that the same four or five colors have been repeated again and again and again? And that creates a cohesiveness, right? So you have, blue and violet which belong to the same family and then you have orange and yellow which belong to the same family and then they are repeated again and again and again in different elements on the table. So that creates a balance between the colors, it creates a harmony and a cohesiveness. Yeah. Um, let's see the next slide. Again, you see the repetition of colors, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, please go on. Here again, the, f the pink flowers in the vase are echoed in the pink, pink uh, accents on the table. The green candles are echoed in the runners on the table or the little green stones on the table. This creates harmony and cohesion. Next. Symmetry. Symmetry is very important because when people sit at the table, everyone should have a view of all the elements on the table. If they don't, they are not going to feel like part of the same group, they're going to be disparate people sitting at a table. So you need that symmetry, How, however you need to guard against too much rigid symmetry, too many straight lines and all of that. So you have symmetry, you have basically the center of the table is the fulcrum and on either side you have the same elements repeated so that everyone at the table feels that sense of cohesion. We go on, here again you see a certain balance, a certain symmetry, the spacing. Yeah. So let's go on to the next principle and this is of great importance. I don't know if you've heard of chromotherapy, the art of healing with colors. Has anyone heard of that? Using colors? Because whether or not we believe in this as a, a healing technique, the fact is that colors affect us. Some colors make us feel pepped up, happy, lively, energetic, some sap us because we have our own associations with colors. So color is very important and how you use it on a dinner table. Um, and of course that creates the mood, mood setting. Okay. So let's go to, again I'm going to speak with my slides. I am just going to ask you without telling you what this is, just the use of these colors, what does it tell you? What is this theme? Christmas? Did I hear Christmas? Exactly. That's how we have our associations with color. So you have this and as Lily said, we had the Christmas theme when you came to dinner. Red, green, white. I don't have to say anything more. Color says it all. Right? Let's go to the next one. Now this is for the Bhutanese here. What associations would you like to make with this slide? It's a time of year, let me say. Her Royal Highness has seen this. <laughs> uh, off. Paddy, yes. And do you see the different levels it is at? So the terraced fields in Bhutan. 
right? So immediately you would, it creates a mood, we are in the monsoon. However, one thing to remember is again, cohesion. If this was the only element on my table, maybe my guests would not get into that monsoon setting mood. So I'm going to show you another slide, which is another element also related to the monsoon, right? The corn, which grows, grows tall and grows in plenty, right? So to create cohesion, you need to have different elements that all relate to the same theme. Only then your guests are really going to, that mood is going to be set. Okay, next. Oh, and here, no, go back. And here, yes, okay, we did that. Next. Sorry. Now, through colors, the use of colors, you can also depict, what do you think this is? What theme do you think this is? Holy, exactly. But if this did not set the mood, can we see the next slide? Would that complete it for you? Would that immediately put you in the holy mood? Yeah, the water pistols. And that's the only time, and as you'll see, I have a great love of uh, nature, and that's the only time I have put plastic on my table. I use nature, yes? We, we'll see it as we go along. Uh, so yes, cohesion, and how to build a theme. Can we go on? What mood does this put you in? Yes, anyone? Season, a season, a mood? Um, Huh? The ocean, yes. And uh, when do you go to the ocean? In the summer? Right. So, you immediately can put your guests into a holiday mood in the height, at the height of summer. Let's see uh, the, the next one. Again, to prove that you need two or three elements that all pertain to the same theme for cohesion. And uh, the other thing about these, these little elements that you, you have is they have a natural way of generating conversation. I once had a guest at my table and I had this setting and uh, it's very, it becomes very playful. He said, can I take those sunglasses? I'm going on summer vacation. Or for the holy theme, immediately my guests, they were so, uh, so sort of enticed by that setting. They said, can we start playing holy right here on the table? I said, no, my tablecloth is white. You cannot do it right here. But, but that's how that creates the mood. So let's go on. Now, we've talked about color and uh, the senses and balance, mood setting, chromotherapy, symmetry, and all of that. But it's not just about the visual appeal and how to build that visual appeal. It's also about that dinner decor reflects not only the decorator's sense of what would appeal to the senses, but also the decorator's sensibilities. What are my beliefs? What are my causes? What are, what are the causes I support? What are my convictions? It reflects that as well. So we'll move on to that. How does dinner decor reflect the decorator's sensibilities? And this is where Bhutan has played a huge role uh, in my dinner decor. Uh, economy. I'm a, I'm a bit of a miser. And I also believe that you should never be stuck and you should never feel that I cannot do dinner decor because I don't, I can't afford beautiful candle stands, I cannot afford beautiful crockery, silverware, linen. So economy is really important. And how do I economize? Can we see the next one? I regularly use items from my kitchen. Utensils, bowls, and use them as flower vases. And I would encourage everyone to do it. Go on. I have right through the book with 20 themes, I have used only these six candle stands. Nothing more fancy. Nothing fancy, nothing more. So economy is important. Responsibility, I've learned this. All, I, I always believed in it, but Bhutan, it echoed, it, it resonated with me when I came here. Uh, I'll show you the next slide and uh, you can tell me what you think this may be used for on the dinner table. What is this? It's just a wood shaving. What do you think it could be used for? 
Yes, can we see the next? Just painted and used as a napkin holder, right? Of course, you make sure, <laughs> thank you, Ambassador uh, Pavan. You make sure, <laughs> keeps telling me I must call him Pavan. So you make, you, you make sure that the paint that you use is safe, etc. But it can be used, okay? What's our next, what's my next sensibility that I'm going to uh, show? Nature's gifts. The nature is bountiful. And if we can see it and recognize it, everything that you need is out there in nature. So if, I'll show you the slide. If you find on a particular day there aren't any flowers, go and look for, pick up mushrooms and use them. And I've used this in the same, in the monsoon theme. So again, that thing of cohesion, everything that belongs to a theme should be there. Okay. Nature makes sure you don't always need fancy napkin holders, porcelain, silver, glass. Use a leaf, just turn it pierce the stem through the leaf and, and use it. Your dinner decor will be visually pleasing, it will entice people and it's economical and it's from nature. As long as you're not disturbing nature or destroying nature. Here, another napkin ring belongs to my monsoon theme. It's the tassel that grows at the top of the corn plant. You just braid it together, loop it and use it. Cohesion again. Go on. What will attract people and create visual appeal is when you do things differently. Instantly they will be attracted to it. You have a basket, you have lots of oranges in Bhutan in January, December, January. So can you make something out of it? Can you create a tea light holder maybe? Sure. And it's God's uh, uh, miracle in nature that not a single drop of water will flow through that peel if you have scooped it carefully. And then you put water in it and float your tea light in it. You don't always need candles. And when you light it up, next one, look at the glow it casts, its own color and its own glow. Right? So next, next sensibility, never be stuck. Never be stuck for, uh, you know, for objects. I don't have this or I don't have that. Problem solving, creativity. When you find you don't have enough flowers, this was in the month of May, I think. Just a few poppies were there in the garden. I didn't have enough, any flowers. I think it was getting warm and the next lot of flowers had not come. What's stopping you from using a, a, the side of a mango and creating a kind of floral arrangement with it? Next. Then, this was February, no flowers again, just a few camellia uh, uh, blooms. I found these under the cedar trees in the garden, painted them and they became part of a floral arrangement without fresh flowers and this was, I needed them for Valentine's Day because they look like perfect roses. So those uh, friends are some of the uh, some of the fundamentals uh, that played that play into my dinner decor. Thank you. Thank you, Amita, for that beautiful presentation, and it's such a visual treat. Here, uh, I think this is going to be a very unique and first book of its kind, and I think. Like me, most of us here are excited about tapping onto your creativity and your ideas on setting better decoration at, at the dinner table. Um, I'm, I'm simply amazed at uh, your imagination and creativity. Um, I know you mentioned that Bhutan has been a positive influence uh, you know, for you to write this book, but if you could share with us, before I open the floor to the audience, if you could share with us uh, when did you start uh, working on these ideas and who had uh, made a lot of influence? I mean, did you grow up with this culture of dinner decor or has there been anybody in your life who's had an influence on you in uh, using all this imagination and uh, something that's, I think, very new for, for most of us? My mother has been a big influence. I've dedicated the book to her. 
she's an ikebana practitioner i grew up with ikebana but i don't believe in uh, doing ikebana i prefer doing the more freestyle of a flower arrangement um so yes that was a big influence and the life i have led as a diplomatic spouse is very very uh, has been uh, has needed me to do this uh, so the skills have been honed uh, in the 30 years that i have lived as a diplomatic spouse thank you thank you we now have 5 minutes and oh, i'll show you the importance okay yeah very, uh, that's the crucial okay amita uh, amita wants to talk about the importance of dinner tech yes, i'm sorry so if you could share yes. more that is actually to me the crux and the essence of dinner decor because dinner decor in itself beauty in itself is characterless and useless unless it serves a function so dinner decor aesthetics and function um so why dinner decor in indian culture um we believe that atithi devo bhava we believe that the guest is like god and you need to honor him so it's very much part of the culture we honor the guest we make him feel special so dinner decor is so completely connected with that with that that uh, sensibility and in times when there is so much violence and we we have the threat of destruction hanging over our heads so dinner decor is not of of earth shattering importance in itself it paves the way for something that's of earth shattering importance and that is dialogue dialogue to solve problems like i said it all begins with uh, with just you know people come to your table they oo and ah over your decor and people who don't know each other who've come to sit at the table they begin to talk about the decor as for a start and that can pave the way for more discussions as lily said you had some important uh, discussions over the across the table so uh, definitely dialogue let's talk about cultural diplomacy this is about showcasing your culture this this uh, was for raksha bandhan last week i had this on the table and i had about 20 pakistani friends over for dinner and it was so wonderful so wonderful that at the end of the dinner i i could explain next slide i could explain to them the ceremony that goes into uh, a raksha bandhan uh, the ritual what is the ceremony because everything was on that thali uh, everything that you need for